Hello, everyone. Welcome to Palladium Magazine's Digital Salon with Michael Schellenberger. I'm Wolf Tyvey, Editor-in-Chief of Palladium. I'm also joined by Ash Milton, our Managing Editor. Good to see you, Ash. Hey, everyone. So our special guest today is Michael Schellenberger. He's an author and an environmental policy writer, founder of Environmental Progress. Michael was invited in 2019 to be an independent expert reviewer at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and has won numerous honors and awards for his work. His new book is Apocalypse Never, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. It will be released in June from HarperCollins. Apocalypse Never is a comprehensive debunking of misinformation about everything from the future of climate change and reinforced destruction to nuclear energy and renewables. It's available for pre-order on Amazon. You can follow Michael on Twitter at SchellenbergerMD. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Thanks for having me, guys. It's fun to be here. Great. So for those of you who have not been at our digital salons, the digital salons are an opportunity for us to get together for interesting intellectual conversations virtually since we can't really do in-person events these days. We're recording the digital salon. It will be released on our Palladium YouTube channel and on our website, um, just the audio on the website and then the video as well on the YouTube. So hello to everyone in the YouTube and uh, on our podcast feed. Uh, in that audience. Um, the salon will run about 90 minutes. First half hour will be discussion between Michael, Ash, and I. Then we'll open it up to a moderated audience Q&A. So please start thinking about the questions, put them into the Q&A feature on Zoom. Please remember to put your questions in the Q&A, not just the chat, uh, so we can make sure that we can see the questions so people can upvote it, et cetera. So, Michael, um, let's start with what got you into environmental activism to begin with in the first place, particularly the unusual area of nuclear energy and, and sort of debunking all the alarmism. Where are you coming from with this? Okay, well, that, that, the first question was sort of how did I become an environmentalist? And then the last part was nuclear. So you're looking at a, a span of, of almost uh, 30 years. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> So, I mean, I first became, um, I was always a very progressive kid. My left-wing parents are, you know, left-wing dad and more of a moderate Democratic mom. Um, and, and so I was always interested in a bunch of other issues than in the environment. I actually started with human rights. I, I'm a Gen Xer, so I was born in 71. By the late 80s, I'm a teenager. So we had Sting advocating for human rights then. You had um, a lot of environmental issues were really big in the late 80s, just like they are today. Um, mm -hmm. And I was one of the, the first issues I was captivated by was the destruction of a rainforest in Central America. Mm -hmm. There's a group in San Francisco called Rainforest Action Network that publicized the role of rainforest destruction in Costa Rica for making meat for Burger King. And they did a, a boycott against Burger King that was very effective. And I was uh, very um, excited about that. I actually threw a party in my backyard when I was like 16 charged everybody a little bit of money to get in and they got beer, cheap beer at the time. And that was my first environmental activism. Um, I, I think I was 16 and then I became a vegetarian. And, and then between that part and becoming pro-nuclear, I did a bunch of different environmental campaigns, helped save redwoods, um, worked on climate change, uh, became a big advocate of renewables. And my the short version of how I changed my mind, and there's a whole TED talk on it. So for people that are really interested in that, you know, it's like an 18 minute TED talk called Why I Changed My Mind About Nuclear. But basically it was understanding why renewables are so totally inadequate to replace fossil fuels. And then just overcoming the main issues with nuclear, which are basically safety, waste and weapons. And after yeah. I overcame those, it wasn't, it didn't take me that long because I'd already embraced the idea that we would solve climate change through technological progress rather than becoming poor, than mm -hmm. everybody becoming poor. So in that sense, changing my mind didn't take too long, but then it became a process of trying to make a living and survive, you know, even though what I, what we believed at that point was contrary to what our, our supporters and, and donors um, supported. So I hope that's, there's a lot in there, but I'll stop mm. with that because I don't know how much. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so let's, let's talk about the renewables thing. Just, uh, just that seems like a good place to dive in. So the, the story I've heard is that 
you know, despite seeming sort of uh, friendly and promising, one of the big issues with the renewables, like particularly wind and solar, is the um, unreliability of the the power delivery. Like it's only there when the sun's out. If it goes behind a cloud, suddenly you have no power. It's only there when the wind is blowing. If there's this little bit of change in weather, the power is fluctuating all the time. But the way the power grids work is you have to deliver the energy at the time that it's used, which means that you have to have a backup power plant that is more reliable backing those renewables. Um, that's like the that's the one issue that I'm kind of aware of on the renewables front. I'd be curious to hear uh, what what your thoughts on that were. Sure, and and uh, also just a, an advertisement for I did an article for Quillette, the online magazine last year. It's actually the most read article in Quillette called "Why Renewables Can't Save the Planet." And then I also did a t I did another TED talk on that. <laughs> I'll summarize them so that if people want to go see more afterwards, that they yeah, can go yeah. there. So renewables refers to kind of everything you would think, wood, water, sunlight, wind, uh, geothermal. Some people think the category is arbitrary. I'm not so sure. I mean, I think it actually refers to things that are truly renewable from the earth that would be there, there you know, regardless. Um, but the, so the main problem with renewables, there's two problems with solar and wind, which the first you mentioned is the unreliability of it, the essential unreliability of solar and wind. But the bigger problem with renewables, all renewables, is the low power densities, meaning they, they, the actual equipment themselves don't produce very much energy for the amount of land they require and the amount of materials they require. Or in the case of, you know, whale oil is, um, you know, I mean, petroleum and whale oil might have similar energy densities as fuels, but petroleum replaces whale oil because you open up the earth to a lot of oil and you get this huge power density out of the ground in that place. Same thing with coal. Mm -hmm. Coal has about twice as much energy in a lump of coal as in a lump of wood, but the difference is, is that you can just get all this coal out of a single point, basically, in the ground, whereas wood, you've yeah. got to go collect it from the trees. The so, yeah. so really the history of human development is the history of moving away from renewables, right? Towards mm -hmm. fossil energy. Towards these more concentrated sources. Exactly. So it's a progression towards energy dense fuels, higher power dense fuels from wood to coal, to oil, to natural gas, to uranium. And uh, in each of that step, you're actually also reducing the carbon intensity of that fuel. And there's mm -hmm. a, there's a reason those two things are correlated. You're using more, they're also more matter dense. They're just more uh, material. Um, you, you know, you're burning coal, you're producing huge quantities, not only of, of air pollution, CO2, but also lots of coal ash is left behind. Whereas mm -hmm. with nuclear, you know, a single glass, a single Coke can of nuclear is enough to give me all the power in my life. And what's left over is a single Coke can, which is why right. the, the waste problem in nuclear is exactly the opposite of what people think it is. It's the, it's the environmental attribute of nuclear is the fact that you put in this tiny amount of fuel and this tiny amount of fuel comes out, it's perfectly contained. It never goes into the environment, mm -hmm. stays on the side of production, perfectly internalized. So, so that's the problem with renewables. I used to think, you know, because I was kind of an engineering dummy, unlike you, you're an actual engineer. I, I'm not a science and I'm not a STEM person. I'm a humanities and social mm -hmm. science type happily energy analysis really only requires arithmetic. And my view is that if you're using more complicated math on energy questions, you're probably doing it in ways that are deceptive. All this modeling to prove things, these models to prove things, that's just entering numbers into a spreadsheet. There, right. I, proved the word, I proved the world can run on renewables because I created an Excel spreadsheet that showed how many wind turbines you would need. Right, it's completely detached. So, anyway, so the long, you know, the long story short is I used to think you could solve these problems with renewables through technological change, make the panels more efficient, make the wind mm -hmm. turbines bigger, but you never make the wind or the sun more energy dense. Nor do you make those two fuels or flows, as we call them, more reliable. Wind, I mean, uh, water is much more reliable. So dams are an incredible, they, dams actually yeah. can replace fossil fuels. You can just turn them on and off. Yeah. Yeah, I saw there was a question I accidentally clicked on the Q&A thing. Someone asked a question of, people say nuclear depends on the fossil system. 
It's actually the opposite. Nuclear is the only technology that can replace a high energy fossil powered society, you know, fossil powered infrastructure. Solar and wind are actually the ones that depend, as you were describing, on an existing electrical infrastructure, usually with a lot of hydro or natural gas, so you can ramp the electricity up and down when the sun and the wind stop, stop doing what we yeah, want. Yeah, nuclear can fill the base load and the renewables can't, basically. Just to give yeah. you a sense of it, you know, France spends half as much for electricity that is 10 times less carbon intensive than Germany. France gets 75% of electricity from nuclear, Germany gets 35% from solar and wind, and they're already maxing. So you both max out how much solar and wind you have because you have to then pay people to take it because it's producing too much power when you don't need it, but then it's not providing enough electricity when you do need it. So that inherent unreliability problem can't be solved with solar mm -hmm. and wind. You have to have a whole other system that they're depending on. Mm. So yeah. the thing uh, at Palladium, right, we talk a lot about institutions and especially institutional succession and uh, resiliency. And nuclear is interesting in this way, right? Because it's one of the few examples I can think of where successfully across a number of countries, there's like an, a concerted and successful effort to basically disassemble this huge institutional legacy that was created um, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And, you know, in your book, you also talk about uh, France and Germany. You look at the U.S. Uh, I know you mentioned Vermont, for example, where they uh, shut down a nuclear plant. Um, you yourself, it sounds like, have done a lot of work trying to keep existing nuclear plants uh, going and sort of countering this project to shut them down. But I'm wondering if you can, you know, tell us a little about how any other number of reforms are always stalled because, oh, they're, you know, it's too complex, it's too, there's too many moving parts, people don't really have the knowledge anymore. But in this case, they seem to be doing it um, very successfully. Uh, so could you tell us a little about that? Why has this been so successful? And then, you know, looking forward, where do you see anyone countering that trend? Where, why have they, been, who, when you say, why have they been so successful? I'm sorry. Like, like why, I, I guess, let me rephrase it. Why has this concerted effort to essentially shut down and disassemble the legacy of not just nuclear plants, but also, you know, the, the knowledge uh, and expertise involved in running them to shut that down and essentially disassemble it physically and institutionally? Is this is a huge project, it seems like, and a lot of people yeah. have coordinated on this. Yes, yeah. The anti-nuclear folks, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, look, there's a, I mean, just to start at the very beginning, I mean, nu the thing you have to understand about nuclear is that it's a completely radical event in human history. People mm -hmm. kind of go, oh, we'll deal with climate change by having solar panels and wind turbines and, you know, geothermal and some electric cars and hydroelectric dams and nuclear power plants and carbon capture and storage. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. One of those technologies is unlike the others. You know, one of those technologies is a new way to make heat like at really high temperatures and completely, obviously that's the potential to decarbonize your entire energy system because you can do hook, you can do cooking and heating and, and industry and hydrogen production, all those other things. It's, it's, and, and then of course it, it, it completely changes the nation state system, the global system, radically alters it. So a kind of a, a weird little country, North Korea can effectively prevent itself from being invaded by the most powerful country in the world. That's just, that's totally radical, like in human history, that some, there's be some secret technology. And so what you've had, obviously, is we're in the period of what historians called the long peace ever since World War II. There's all this hand wringing about it, but basically everybody now kind of goes, guess it was because of the bomb, even if you don't think it was because of the bomb or you don't want to give the bomb any credit, Obviously, the apocalyptic scenario has never occurred, and you still have these little countries totally changing things. So the technology is such a radical event. It would be as though fossil fuels and gunpowder were invented within a 10 or 15 year period together as part of the same basic industrial process. It equalizes but, countries the same way that guns equalize individuals. Yeah, I mean, so gunpowder revolution obviously leads to large standing untrained, uh, large standing armies, or not standing, but large armies of untrained soldiers can suddenly be weaponized. Whereas you, before you had this period of, you know, you had to be a professional soldier. So now you have these huge armies. Gunpowder allows the formation of nation states. 
it's this re revolutionary thing, right? From whatever 14th century to, um, you know, all the way to, you know, mid 20th century, that's the gunpowder is the, and you get these consolidated nation states and, um, but they would still be able to prey on each other, the big ones, but then you get this radical technology and suddenly small countries can defend themselves entirely. And you can also get national defense for relatively cheap. We haven't seen that occur yet. All of that's to say, you get into the 50s and, and there's a, and everybody dealing with this technology is like in a state of shock. They don't know what to do with it. They actually end up terrifying each other. The US government, um, you know, Eisenhower was worried about scaring people too much because he knew that they would demand more spending on military, which he actually wanted to cut. But basically, you know, we see these movies coming out in the 50s of radiation turning lizards into giant monsters, Godzilla, right? Or you see, right. mm -hmm. you see a whole theme, Susan Sontag, the literary, the brilliant literary critic, you know, she sort of observes these movies are actually a way to deal with a kind of trauma because you go to the movie theater, nuclear creates this crazy monster. The scientists and the and the military get together and they they vanquish the monster and you, everyone's relieved and you get to go home. But of course, you go home out of the theater and you're still like living under this crazy situation. So, so then you then you kind of go. Somebody's going to take advantage of this this shock and politicize it and turn it into their bigger agenda. And that's basically what former socialists did after World War II, they took this previously apocalyptic vision of Marxism and socialist revolution. And George Orwell, God bless him, because he's brilliant, but he sort of contributes to the sense in which nuclear weapons are this, are, and, and nuclear energy by extension are this apocalyptic threat. So what you were mentioning is absolutely correct. The people who think they can get rid of nuclear energy have this wild vision that they'll somehow eliminate the knowledge of fission. I mean, the problem is, that you know that fission, the splitting of atoms, uh, comes right out of like lab level work, right out of the science. I mean, that's you know they have to create an industrial infrastructure to make bombs and and power plants, but but the ability to split atoms, it's just in ineradicable. Even if you killed every nuclear engineer in the world, the knowledge would still come back from just the nature of our society. Well, society. And, and I want to touch on because in your answer there you're bringing up you know there there was this fear around nuclear as a weapon on the other hand um there was this use as an energy and today you know they're often conflated in ways at least as a tactic to imply that nuclear power is somehow intrinsically bound up in the destructiveness of nuclear weaponry but it seems like for a, at least a few a couple of decades there was this whole ethos or aesthetic around nuclear energy where they really tried to wrest it from this apocalyptic vision and give it this more positive uh scientific and say progressive um goal and for in this period, it seems like there is a split, right? Nuclear energy and nuclear weapons are distinctive technologies here. Like, do you think that's true? And uh, if this was a successful program, why does it seem to have collapsed so completely where now fear kind of governs yeah. all of these technologies? Yeah, I mean, look, the dominant story that's told by the nuclear scientific technical and in industrial communities, they're not exactly the same because there's the power plants and then there's the whole government, whatever. But the dominant story, at least in the West, has been that these technologies are separate. You know, they don't really have anything to do with each other. Um, but that's not really the case and never has been. Um, what the reality is, is that if you can split atoms, you can split atoms to make electricity, make heat, and then make electricity, or you can split atoms to make heat all at once, yeah, really <laughs> rather fast. than spread out. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, there was early desire, the, 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 the desire to split the good from the bad of this technology was there at the beginning. So Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the bomb from my town of Berkeley, he was like, well, we can denature uranium. This idea came out of alcohol because we can denature, you know, if you denature alcohol, it becomes rubbing alcohol and you can't drink it without getting sick. They thought, well, we could do something like that with uranium. Total wishful thinking. If you have the knowledge of how to, if you really have the knowledge and infrastructure for how to make power, you should have the right infrastructure to make a bomb. Now, we have all these things we do to try to prevent countries from being able to make those things. Um, and we have all these safeguards. 
But when we did our research on this, this was very controversial with, as you might imagine, within the pro-nuclear community. Mm -hmm. um, what we find is that a number of countries appear to get nuclear energy in order to have a weapons option. And in fact, it's such a strong yeah. motivation that it's like it's just a clearly a, a big motivation. Um, and in fact, the science, the political scientists who've studied this, and it, the research is pretty strong, that those countries appear to gain a military benefit just from having nuclear power plants. How's so I, joke, I would joke around. I go, I go, wow, this is a really like big selling point of nuclear power plants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know the nuclear industry. Of course, they hate it. They don't want to. They want to kind of. So my book. How do you, it, how do you mean that they get a nuclear that a, a military benefit from the nuclear plants? Yeah. Is that, so is in that, other words, you can show you can show that the countries they they're able to show through a bunch of different measures that the countries that have some kind of nuclear program gain some kind of national security advantage. Some kind of it's called nuclear latency. Mm -hmm. If you have some amount of a research reactor at the university. You know, if you have a, uh, you know, um, some part of your society is using nuclear in some way, you get something called latency. So when you go to Japan, it's always interesting because I work, I do, I go, I travel a lot. I've been traveling a lot. I go to Japan and I've been going a lot, you know, for a while. And at first they would go, <laughs> it was meetings where the Japanese would be like, you know, we just want to talk about, we want to talk about how we have all this plutonium for a little bit. We have all this plutonium in Japan. So much plutonium, We're trying to figure out what to do with our plutonium. Um, and they would give, and be like, that's so weird. Like, why is that? And then it would be like in the same, and then they kind of be in the same part of the conversation where they would talk about how they have a rockets program. Mm -hmm. Right. I go to Argentina and I'm like, and I, and, and I'm giving some lectures on nuclear energy and they, they go, um, well, yeah, the rocketry program is in the nuclear, um, energy program. Well, why is that? So they want you to know. I kind of get in there. I was like, this is like a secret weapons program, right? I mean, are we just... Yeah. Anyone we, working on the energy side that, as friends on the weapons side. It, it doesn't I mean, sound like it's very secret either. Yeah. It's like an open secret. I mean, right. um, you know, and you kind of go, well, why do you have the can-do reactors? You know, which was a particular Canadian... Well, you guys are Canadian, so, I mean, which we li I like this, but there's a way... Part of the advantage of that is, well, you can use natural uranium, but also there's some ideas that maybe it would be a little bit easier... The Canadians hate it when I say these things, but I mean, countries, this is how they behave. Um, Easier to weaponize? Uh, what's that? Easier to weaponize? You said you said the can-do reactors are easier. Oh, okay, potentially easier. easier to push the plutonium out the back. Um, right. Yeah, to get the plutonium. Inspectors. Mm -hmm. Not really. I mean, if you inspect it right. So, um, so you know, the response from the pro-nuclear community was very upset. Uh, I mean, this is some, one of the motivations for me to write the book, because this book was a nuclear book that was rejected by every publisher. <laughs> and then the last publisher was like, I want to do a book on the environment. And I, and I had a book on the environment that I'd been working on, but I had abandoned because it was too, it was kind of called How Humans Save Nature, which is a part of Apocalypse Never, but it was too kind of um, boring. Mm -hmm. The book about like, yeah, you know, that's how we save the whales, and you know, and here's how you save gorillas. And it was like, no, okay. So then finally, I was like, well, let me see if these two books kind of work together, and also a criticism of apocalyptic environmentalism. So the book is basically a criticism of apocalyptic environmentalism, how humans save nature, and then nuclear kind of runs through. There's a single chapter on it, but nuclear actually, as you'll discover when you read it, it runs through like the last. Mm -hmm. It goes from chapter, the official chapter is chapter eight, but then it runs all the way through chapter 12 because nuclear is so important. The originary environmental alarmism, the original apocalyptic device. And so I point out at the end of the Cold War, when the apocalyptic threat of nuclear war basically ends, I mean, not totally, but like the idea that the Soviet Union, the United States would somehow get into a nuclear war became, nobody thought that was really very likely. And right. so everybody who had been active the left, right, on nuclear weapons abolition, nuclear energy abolition, goes on to work on climate change. Mm -hmm. So climate, so people, this book in some ways was me trying to ask, answer the question, why are the people who are most apocalyptic about climate change most against the only, I mean, really, that's what I believe, 
really the only essential technology to solving climate change. So Michael, as someone who's both pro-nuclear and anti-alarmism, I'm interested to hear your solution to this conflation of weapons and energy. Do you think you can somehow come around this or is it just a part of the deal uh, that has to be made if countries are going to come back to nuclear? Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, the book, there's a, the book is having a bunch of arguments that some of which are not totally public and may never be or whatever. But one of the arguments is that we can sell nuclear to the public without actually dealing with the source, the, what I think is the underlying source of the anxiety, which is the bomb. Hmm. I mean, otherwise, like, even Chernobyl, I mean, it's like we now, in my book, I point out, it looks like maybe we think 200 people will die from Chernobyl over like an 80 year period. That includes the, you know, the 50 or so that were, you know, injured at the night, you know, during the accidents. And so why is there this, the only thing that explains the overreaction to nuclear, this fear of nuclear, you know, here it's like, we're in the midst of this pandemic, right? Where it's like millions of people, the whole economy is crashing and you were worried about like a nuclear power, you were worried about some radiation from a nuclear plant, it looks ridiculous. The only thing that seems to explain it to give it all the energy it has is the fear of the bomb and the fear of the apocalypse. So yeah, I mean, I'm basically saying in this book, like a psychologist would, <laughs> if you've got this like inner trauma drama that you're just bottling up and not talking about, um, and it's, you're, we're allowing it to control us through our unconscious. And so by surfacing it, by talking about it, and ultimately explaining why we are never, ever, ever going to get rid of the ability to split the atom. We're never going to mm -hmm. get rid of nuclear weapons. And I point out that these really good Yale, you know, and they were Harvard too, but these Yale guys in 1945, they put together a study group and they figure out like within weeks of the bomb being used August, you know, 1945, that there's no way we can ever get rid of the bomb. Any two countries that have the bomb pointed at each other, United States and Soviet Union, they get rid of it. And if they go to war, guess what the first thing they're going to do is? They're going to put together their weapons and worse, right, like, out, I use it on the other guy. Right, like with the case of Japan, right? You know, they have the rockets program, they have the nuclear power plants program, and and estimates are that basically, if if they wanted to, they could pretty quickly get to a bomb. Yeah, this idea of being like, you know, a few turns of the screw away from full nuclear capability, right? Right. So, um, so the answer to your question is, my, I mean, what I'm excited about with this book, because honestly, I think in retrospect, it's a much better book than I was than I had either written on the environment or on nuclear. This right. book, getting at that, like there's a way in which nuclear apocalypse is the engine that drives every other apocalypse. Hmm. You know, and I talk about how like, you know, a fear of death and fear of the apocalypse are not the same thing. No. But there is definitely some fear of death, but fear of but there's often with like the apocalyptic left, there's also a kind of excitement around apocalypse that, that betrays the underlying motivations. So, you know, it's always a funny, this was the other funny thing. It was like, you know, you listen to like Bill McKibben or Greta Thunberg or Extinction Rebellion, which is this, you know, climate group in Britain. Mm -hmm. And they tell you about how terrible human civilization is. Human civilization right. is horrible. Horrible. What a, we're just a cancerous growth on nature, destroying the world. It's, it's gonna, we're going to destroy the world. And then they go, so we have to do these things to save human civilization. And it's like, well, I just, I thought you hated civilization. So why do you want to save it? Like, you know, right. and then you look at all the things that they want to do to save it. And it's basically going back to pre-industrial civilization, going back to renewables, going back to mm -hmm. low intensity agriculture, going back to small community life, I mean, sort of it's changed a bit on the cities, but, but that, the, that the, there is genuine fear on nuclear weapons. It's how nuclear weapons work. If, nuclear, if you weren't scared of nuclear weapons, they wouldn't work so well, right? right. So like, yeah, yeah. People go, are you saying people shouldn't be scared of nuclear weapons? I was like, that would be like, first of all, no, that would be terrible. Because the, that's the reason nuclear weapons work is because everybody's scared of them. We give it this fancy word, deterrence, it's just whatever. Yeah. It's just scaring people. So then, so that, but, and then is it like, well, then are you telling people that nuclear power plants have nothing to do with weapons? No, because I'm not going to lie to you anymore. You know, the, there's this pat, there's this paternalism both in the US military, in the political establishment, in the nuclear electrical industry, which is like, oh, don't you worry your pretty little head. You know, we've got this. 
Tech, right. We've right. got this crazy technology completely under control because we know how dangerous it is. Well, then you get Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima, and everybody goes, I don't know. Doesn't seem like you've got right. very it's not control actually. over it. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. a loss of faith in the actual institutional mechanism. So uh, I, I have a question about kind of what's holding us back on nuclear. I mean, there's, there's obviously this kind of anti-nuclear lobby. I'd be curious to kind of maybe hear a bit more about that. But, but the thing that sort of two big sort of aspects that you might think of in terms of like, well, what would it take to kind of go forward with nuclear and do more nuclear? There's the economic question is, it comes up occasionally, people claim, oh, nuclear is actually really expensive. It requires these huge investments that can't really be done by the private sector and the governments aren't really good at doing it either. And the insurance is just off the charts and so on. And then there's sort of caught up in that, there's also this question of like technological and industrial capability. Have we lost perhaps the, the human capital or the optimism or, or the industrial capacity as a society to build projects on this scale or to, to believe in projects on this scale? Uh, so there's a bunch of those kind of objections that come up to nuclear. I'd be curious to hear what you have to say about those. Yeah, so I mean, the thing that's common to nuclear everywhere in the world is the fears, the apocalyptic fears of the bomb, which then I use the psychological concept of displacement. It's actually a fancy word for scapegoating. So we scapegoat nuclear power plants. You know, we scapegoat um, other things for, for you know, nuclear. That's a, that happens like everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, like, uh, you know, the country in the West I'm most excited about for nuclear is Britain. Well, Britain's building two reactors at a place called Hinkley Point C, which is just building two new reactors. And, and, and but then they've got another project that they want to build at Sizewell. And then they've got a third project they want to build. Same type of reactors on each build. It would be the same construction crews or mostly it would kind of move up the road mm -hmm. in Britain. That's the, like, when you go look at the economics of nuclear, there is only one way we know how to reduce the cost of nuclear and thus reduce the risk. And, but really, yeah. only way, same people building the same kind of reactors over and over again. Yeah, that's it. Mass, that's mass, mass production. Actually, that's all we actually know. There's some people who believe and wish to believe, I think, and, um, and have an opinion, and they assert that some technical change is going to be the key to some big cost reductions. We've never seen that. In fact, what we see is the more technical changes you get, the higher the cost because you've deprived all those workers of the knowledge that they had that made them build the reactors faster and faster over time. So we see that in France, we see that in Korea, we've even seen it in the United States. So Britain's, I love it because it's like, you know, um, you know, they're being very smart about it. Sometimes it's private money, sometimes it's public money, but it doesn't really matter because what matters when it's private money, it's like, you know, pension money, it's low yield. It's you want, so you want cheap money as well, right? You mm -hmm. don't want to be paying the banks for this. Um, you know, the United States is the country that worries me the most in the West, just because, you know, it was, we created this thing. I mean, we really, I mean, it's really America's mm -hmm. technology more than any other country's technology. You know, the problem is not just the anti-nuclear movement, which is very, very powerful. It's also obviously we have all this abundant natural gas. Most right. parts of the world, they are getting cheaper gas from LPG, um, sorry, um, LNG, but um, but, there's, but but nuclear is still a really good way to kind of create a, a, a decarbonized base load. You know, there's other countries like, you know, if you just go to Japan, you know, they had 40% they had, uh, nuclear before Fukushima, I think. I think they were headed towards 50. I might have that a little bit wrong. I might have been 30 headed towards 50, but they had a lot and they were going to do more. And then this reaction of Fukushima is just so intense you know yeah. and i think it makes sense because as much as i love japan and i love the japanese people in so many ways they are very neurotic like they're just extremely neurotic and i and the thing i point out in the book is that there is a kind of when everybody stops believing in god i think that this superstitious magical parts of our brain right <laughs> need something else superstitious and magical to believe in and so that's and the, why, and that's and that ends up animating so much of those fears. Yeah, and th this is why so often these these kind of environmental apocalyptic narratives end up looking kind of religious, or or they have this religious vibe to them. Mm -hmm. I want to just you know highlight something you said there, which I think is a very important, but people often miss, um, and it's a bit of what I was touching on earlier. 
as we shut down these programs, it's not just a matter, right, of shutting down a nuclear plant because, you know, the, the idea might be, oh, if we really change our mind, we can just go back and start building them again. But that's not true at all. Be when you're shutting down the physical plants, when you're not building anymore, and when very vested energy interests in other sectors are now getting all the engineering expertise, uh, we're also going to lose the actual tradition of knowledge around managing nuclear power. Yeah, and all I those people who are building it. Yeah, yeah. For well, I, you know, this famous incident where a, a component of, um, of of nuclear weapons had been basically the, the knowledge of how to build it had been lost um, in the U.S. government. And I, I think that when we start looking at it in the way you said here, where you're losing a tradition of knowledge, you're purposely shutting down, actually, transmission of knowledge. And in fact, the country that created this tradition is, you know, one of the major players doing it. Um, I've never really heard that frame as much as I think it should be used. Um, that's a major loss institutionally. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, um, you know, I spent, um, um, I'm on my second sort of research organization. I, my last research organization I was at from 2003 to 2015. And I felt like I got to the bottom of a bunch of big environmental issues and m many, many environmental trends are going in the right direction. Population, air pollution, even carbon emissions aren't doing too bad. Um, but with the one big thing that was going in the wrong direction was nuclear. It was 18% of our electricity globally in the mid 90s. Today, it's down to 10%. It's gonna go to the, it's gonna go to the single digits. And, and there's a bunch of reasons to like nuclear beyond climate change including land use, materials, throughput. It's just the most, um, it's just the most, it's the most environmental, it's the environmentally best technology. So, mm -hmm. so I, I, I decided to, to basically become an activist. And in 2016, I started this new organization. I've been advocating for nuclear for exactly what you said. I mean, what you said is exactly right. I view every nuclear reactor in the world as precious and every nuclear plant site as particularly precious. You think about how hard it is to build like an apartment building. Imagine getting permissions today rather than like in the 60s or 70s when they got them to build right. a nuclear power plant. And those power plant sites, so that's what the British are doing, are the sites of future nuclear. So if you don't, if you have something against today's nuclear, you gotta, it's gotta be thorium for you or you need, you need fusion. Where are you gonna put your fancy new reactor in the future if we shut down all of our nuclear plants? It's, it's madness. I mean, with nuclear power, a nuclear powered world is a world where the human footprint has shrunk. I mean, here we are like worried about all these different environmental problems, but with nuclear, you just can shrink your energy infrastructure to mm -hmm. very like almost nothing. You don't even need pipelines at that point anymore, unless you're doing hydrogen. But so, I mean, for me, it was always like, you got to fight for nuclear literally for future generations. Because right now, nuclear, it's 20% of US electricity. But if you think that nuclear will one day be 100% of our energy, you're talking not just about an increase from 20% to 100% for electricity, but a tr you know, then an additional tripling, since primary energy tends to be about one third electricity, one third transportation, and one third heating and cooking. Mm -hmm. right. um, so we had another topic going to get on as well. I just want to close here, though, maybe one or two minutes. Um, you mentioned thorium and so on. Um, in this discussion, people talk about thorium. They talk about how current technology for nuclear plants is different than it has been on the past regarding dangers like meltdown and so on. Um, maybe give us some insight, like what are the big technological changes here that we should actually be looking at? Um, for the, the most important technological changes are the technological changes between humans and technology. And I object, so I get into arguments with the technical fixed types for a bunch of reasons. The first is I think their motivation is wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you really deal with how radical nuclear is and the fears that it inspires, it's so much easier to be like, oh no, it's just a completely different technology. And so all your fears should go away. Well, that doesn't actually deal with anybody's fears. So I'm not a big fan of this idea that this, this thing of telling people that we're going to have... The second thing is that it's just not true. In the history of nuclear safety, what matters is human technology, it's the relationship. You know, nuclear is human beings. I think there's this thing where, particularly among men, particularly among engineers, 
you, people look at a nuclear power plant and they go, the nuclear part of that is all the machines. It's all the, it's all the physical objects. No, it's just like what you were saying. It's mm. like the people that run the plant. It's the workers, it's the, it's the yeah. executives, it's the engineers, it's the, and then there was always this relationship with the universities and, and these big supply chains. And so, so I think this, um, so it's kind of like, yeah, so we have better control panels. We have, you know, this new AP 1000, which is the one that they're building in the South that had water, you know, backup coolant over the reactor. That's great, although nothing is as important as just management and human factors. I mean, the great thing about Three Mile Island, you know, Three Mile Island happens in 1979. Um, it was a great accident to have in so many ways because, you know, nobody dies, nobody gets injured, nobody gets dangerous doses of radiation. And the industry with the governments around the world, they put in place these, these trainings, these crazy, amazing checklists. You know, at one point, the Hospitals Association went to the nuclear industry and they said, hey, can we learn from each other? And at the end of it, the hospitals were like, they were like, we can only learn from you because the nuclear operations are so much better organized with checklists and all that stuff. So, mm -hmm. so there's a, there are machine things, but I just want to emphasize that, that human workforce part is just essential. So it's fundamentally like an institutional social technology kind of problem rather than necessarily material technology. Yeah, so you would be kind of like have jet planes and um, air traffic control centers improved the technology since the 1960s? Yeah, sure. They, of course they have. And is it, has it made things safer? Absolutely. But to kind of go describe the incredible safety improvements in the air traffic system would miss this incredible human factors story. Right. Yeah. Which I think is the main event. Cool. Okay, so let's let's wrap up the nuclear for now. We also had some other stuff like Ash mentioned that we wanted to discuss. I mean, the, the whole rest of your book is about kind of the rest of climate alarmism, people's irrationalities or false narratives around various issues. One that we were talking about uh, in, in sort of our preparation here was um, relevant to the kind of current per coronavirus pandemic, which is the, um, the, the question of you know, we were talking about like the the way the farming system in in China ha had been involved in this, and how some people, you know, so some of the advocates for environmentalism are also advocates against factory farming. They're advocates for kind of decentralization of farming, right? Um, and and you have kind of made the opposite case that actually factory farming is more efficient. It's more safe in many ways. Um, and, and you even had the idea that this is related to the coronavirus situation. And so I'd love to hear that take just expanded and, and yeah, and that, my, that stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on a piece that basically argues first, or it's maybe two pieces first, you know, why pandemics are a greater threat to civilization than climate change. Right. And then the other one is why we need more industrialized agriculture to prevent future pandemics. So just to take the second part of it before we started this, when you guys, when I were talking, I was criticizing this conversation between Danny Kahneman and Nassim Taleb, where they both agreed, A, you can't predict anything, and B, we need decentralized, I'm just to be fair, it was Taleb who said, we need decentralized systems, not, not Kahneman. Um, because decentralized systems, he said, are more basically more resilient, are more anti-fragile, well, here you have a decentralized farming system in South China, thousands of family farms, often on the frontier of wilderness, where bats can roost, urinate, and defecate on top of pigs that are then taken to market. People do eat bats, so the bats, the live bats might be, you know, in cages next to or above other animals that are consumed, and so they may shed these coronaviruses, which bats are a huge reservoir for. So I interviewed all the scientists involved in this, and because at first they said, well, the intensification of meat production is a risk factor, which right. is true. If you concentrate a lot of animals together, it is, it does, it is a risk factor. But then there's all these obvious advantages to industrialized, intensified meat production. Obviously, you, you just, you have higher labor productivity, fewer workers for more meat production. You have, um, you know, so it's more cap, it's more capital labor and, and energy productive, more energy, you know, and more land efficient. So, mm -hmm. so the costs, so basically when I ask these guys, I go, you know, are you going to have a better, they, they want to implement something called, let me, let me say one thing first though, so people don't misunderstand. Future pandemics, the main event is still going to be early detection 
and action because you're never going to be able to stop the spillover of these zoonotic viruses from wildlife to humans either yeah. directly or through domesticated animals. We'll never be able to stop that. So I want to, I don't want to suggest that what I'm proposing is like a main, like the main event. It's not, but it is important to try to reduce the amount of what they call spillovers from these zoonotic, from these wildlife to humans. And I asked the scientists, is they going to have an easier time doing that in, you know, 50 large industrialized meat operations farther from the forest frontier, by the way, hardened structures and money to test the animals and the workers, or are you going to be able to put those security measures with those thousands of farms on the forest frontier? There's no question, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, this, I think there's, I think with coronavirus, cause you know, with climate change, it's so slow moving, you know, that even with the exaggerations, nobody proposed, shutting down societies. Well, now with coronavirus, you know, with these pandemics, the time scale is the exact opposite of climate change. You know, it's right. why I'm a, it's why I'm a pandemic alarmist because we were like, my conservative friends are like, why are you a pandemic alarmist? You've criticized environmental alarmism. Yeah, because you need alarmism on pandemics. You have to shut the whole society down like right now, prevent it from spreading. Like climate change is like, it's like literally we're worried about 21, we're worried about 2100. You know, we're worried about 2200. We should be, but it's that's different. So, so you know, I hope that the this pandemic helps us to kind of consider the fact that we have been so focused on climate change, and it's been so romantic. You know, the Michael Pollan, we're all going to live on farms, and it's just that I think we, this should wake people up a bit that 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 our first of all our priorities have been skewed you know had there been had, had Greta Thunberg been a pandemic activist it's hard not to imagine that governments around the world might have responded better to this but instead you had Bill Gates giving a warning I watched his I watched his TED talk right when the pandemic began it had fewer than a million views now it has 20 now it's like 30 million views you know so if you had had that amount of alarmism on pandemics it's hard not to imagine us having had a better response to them, but that's right. I'd like to push you a bit on the decentralization question. So my understanding of the criticism behind things like factory farms are, you know, it's not purely environmental, right? Um, we, a, a big thing, for example, is standardization of breeds and so on. And uh, obviously breeds can differ to the degree to which they're susceptible to certain viruses. So the equivalent uh, in agriculture might be uh, the, the Irish famine um, in potatoes, where a, pretty much the same kinds were being grown in the country. Um, and so when there was a collapse, it was an easy system in which collapse could take over. Um, now, I guess we could argue, oh, well, large centralized farms could choose to diversify. And I mean, that's theoretically true, but for on the margin economic reasons, you usually don't see that happen. Um, and, and so despite the fact that, yeah, it's easier to regulate on a certain level, my understanding of the arguments of people like Taleb, um, is that it's more to do with this kind of mass standardization of a system, which then becomes very easy to collapse. But what's an example of that though? Well, I, I think like in agriculture, the Irish famine would be, I, I don't know my deep uh, livestock history so much, yeah. but presumably, um, well, let's you know, take the different... Irish, let's take the Irish famine one, which by the way is a, you know, mid 19th century, right? Like 18... Mm -hmm. Well, sure, but we still have 30s. viruses and we still have yeah. people... But let's take the Irish famine. I, I write about the Irish sure. potato famine in my book. Um, during the Irish potato famine, the Irish were exporting food to Britain. Mm-hmm. Um, well, e exporting. Britain was taking food from Ireland, I think. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but in, either, other words, like, you know. in other words, like, look, Amartya Sen proved in 1981, he won the Nobel Prize for Economics for the, this observation in 1981. We didn't need him to prove it because everybody knew this. Hmm. But we don't get, fam famines are not natural or they're not, they're not, like, I think there's this picture, oh my gosh, Ethiopia had a drought and so all those people are dead. No, there was a war going on. Famines are a con famines are a are a are a political tool, you know. The British, the whole time, the British are taking food out of Ireland, and writing. And the Economist, you know, and these you know the elites in Britain were all talking about how the Irish, you know, that they were paying the price for their their 
you know, their fertility, basically. They were overbreeding. It was the same argument. Sure. Yeah, and I wouldn't disagree with this this point here, but yeah. uh, there, there, despite this happening, there was also this yeah. phenomenon going on, right? And so... Well, here, um, here's, the, here's the thing. I mean, so to some extent, yeah, do you get... So it's the same... It's actually the same thing as the concentration of meat production. Do you get problems from concentration like that? Yes. Um, do they result in system-wide collapse? No, they don't. Um, you know, in fact, um, you know, it's like, that's the whole point. Like the potatoes went, but it's not like everything else failed in the Irish food system. And if the system were so, were, if, the, if the current system of, of highly concentrating agriculture were so fragile, then we wouldn't be producing so much goddamn food. We're producing, we produce 25% more food than we need today. Humankind mm -hmm. has never been at these levels. I mean, you might remember even before the coronavirus, People were worried about food waste. Well, food waste is what you get when you produce too much food. But what would you rather have? Too much, a problem of too much food waste or a problem of like always coming in super efficiently? Obviously, we would rather have too much food waste, right? You'd rather be producing too much. So, so, mm -hmm. so I think the, the point is, yes, there are problems that get created in the system. But I think it actually, you look at the global food system, it would either be what he would call robust or anti-fragile. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't, it would, the system is much less fragile now than it was in 1700 or 1800. This is really interesting. Uh, but, but let's move on to, I think, some audience questions. We've been going for maybe a bit longer than we planned. Um, this is a really interesting question from Jasper Boers. What lessons can be drawn from the Japanese government's success in pushing nuclear power in the 50s and 60s, despite the historical memory of the atom bomb? Like they got nuked. Uh, so, you know, they very, very uh, saliently felt the fear of, of the whole thing. How did the Japanese public opinion of nuclear power change as a result of... of yeah, that? this is... Um, I'm glad that someone asked this because I didn't... That whole story I told about nuclear being so radical and, and how we're still kind of adjusting to that new reality 75 years later, I didn't quite finish the point, which was that in the 50s and 60s, in Japan, in the United States, it was the same everywhere in the world, basically there was clearly a kind of almost manic um, embrace of nuclear energy for peace, of atoms for peace. And so you even see it when Eisenhower, in the book I write about how Eisenhower gives his famous atoms for peace speech in 1953. And, and there was this weird, there was so much going on, but basically Oppenheimer, the father of the bomb was like, you have to, he told the president, it's like, you have to tell the American people how dangerous this weapon is. That this weapon is not, there's no getting into wars with other countries with the bomb. Like the American people need to understand that. Um, and to some extent, I think they are already getting, we're getting it. But anyway, all right, here we are on the, you know, you know, uh, the Russians now had, um, you know, um, big bombs. So, so, so then Eisenhower says, I can't just go tell everybody that we're on the brink of Armageddon. I have to give some good news. He's a really intelligent president. I think it's a good instinct. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he probably reads the book of Isaiah and says we have to, you know, beat our swords into plowshares and do and make nuclear energy. We always knew you could do, we've known since 1900 or whatever, since Marie Curie, that one day radioactivity would be, that these elements would be harnessed for energy as well as for weapons. So we always knew there'd be energy. He gets up and he gives the speech. Adams for Peace, it's a brilliant speech. And he says, you know, this wet, this thing could destroy us or it could end poverty in the world. At the end of the speech, everybody stands up in the United Nations General Assembly and they applaud him for 10 minutes. I can't help but see that, that, react, that intense reaction as a kind of relief, but also like kind of like you want to think that's true. You know, like you go, yeah, oh my God, yes, nuclear for peace. Yes, thank God, right? Yeah, there's um, a vision there that's being given. Yeah, and there's and, there, and it's truly a beautiful vision. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not not a beautiful vision. It's a beautiful vision, but the didn't the, the bomb didn't go away. Like it didn't it didn't you know it didn't eliminate the risk of nuclear you know war or nuclear weapons, and and yet I think what it did is it kind of put it psychologically in the subconscious. You know, where as we know, when you have these subconscious fears, they can play all sorts of mischief on you. You know, when you make your fears conscious and you go, well, why don't, why don't I want to stand up to my boss? 
well, I'm scared that, you know, he'll fire me. Well, what happens if you get fired? Well, I guess I'd probably find a new job. When you actually surface your fears, you can confront them and deal with them. But nuclear just ends up going here. And then it's magnified, I think, in Japan and Germany because they, they, they don't get to have a bomb after World War II. You know, Britain gets the bomb. France gets the bomb. But no, Japan and Germany, they don't get the bomb for reasons that you might anticipate. We didn't trust them to have a bomb. We're like, this is your, but I think that made the Japanese feel vulnerable. And so I think it is also the case that the Japanese and the German publics have been very, very anti-nuclear weapons and actually increasingly anti-nuclear energy over time. I told a German I once met at a, at a retreat, I said, part of the reason the Germans you know, you, you're against nuclear weapons because you don't get one, you know? So it's like, you, that's your way of trying to, you know, level the playing field. And also, because the Germans and the Japanese, they, they think they're the best. I mean, if you go to Germany, the Germans are more snobby about it, but the Germans, they are, in some ways, they are the best. They're just good at everything. They're good at coronavirus. I mean, it's oh, like- I've heard, I've heard China uses Germans to run their nuclear plants. Is that true? There's probably some amount of collaboration there. Um, I would it's probably that's probably an overstatement, but but so the Germans and Japanese here you are like not only are your people vulnerable, you're kind of insulted. Here's the best kind of weapon, the ultimate weapon as it's known, and they don't get to have it. So mm -hmm. then here you get you know a couple decades later here they are crusading trying to get people to get rid of their bombs. Never going to happen, but I think then. You can't get rid of the bombs, but we can shut down our own nuclear plants. So it got a little bit of sour grapes in it. And again, mm -hmm. all of it happening in the subconscious or unconscious, not consciously. So I, there's another ahead. interesting question uh, that, that follows on this very nicely from Stephen Pimentel, um, sort of on these kind of mythological and, and uh, irrational aspects of the problem. So if fear of nuclear power has been incorporated into such an apocalyptic political narrative, uh, do we then need a balancing alternative mythological narrative that's that's the positive yes. side, um, and and not necessarily just the rational narrative, but that like atoms for peace kind of uh, yes. positive vision? Yes, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think on on the global system, the way that you know, I'm spoiling the book a little bit, so please, it's not. I'm not giving the whole book away. So you're still, they're still there. <laughs> right there. But you know, part of it is like you know, the global system. Every time the global system changes, we see apocalyptic movements, grassroots movements. So the first time, of course, is 1970. You get Earth Day. Well, that's right in the middle of the Vietnam War, plus all sorts of continuing Cold War tensions and maybe some reverb from, from the you know, fears of nuclear war of the early 60s. You get the late 80s at the end of the Cold War, and you get the now, after Brexit and Trump. Clearly, you get this much more apocalyptic. And I point out that the environmental movement used to have a pretty good balance between utopianism and apocalypticism. But just if you look from 2016 to now, if you look at Extinction Rebellion, you look at Greta Thunberg, there's not a lot of like promised land in their story. It's just like straight Armageddon. Apocalypse was always supposed to have utopia behind it. But so, um, so yes, I mean, I think there is an alternative mythology. I think it, it's helpful that the mythology is grounded in reality and science, which is that what a relief, you know, here we created this apocalyptic weapon and there was no apocalypse. And in fact, it, do, it appears to be at the heart of the tech, it appears to be a technical fix for war. I mean, it's, it, people will hate it when I say this, you know, but it's kind of like, remember after the Cold War, all of the experts, like just unanimously in the United, they were like, they were like, well, that's fine because we were civilized and the Russians are kind of civilized too. But when the bomb goes to India and Pakistan, oh, those barbarians are gonna nuke the shit out of each other. I mean, they didn't say it quite like that, but that was basically what the establishment- The inherent, yeah. That's what they would say. Well, it gets to India and Pakistan and, and you can just see the trend lines. They have these wars. Well, the wars, fewer and fewer and people die. Those the way they get the weapons, you know, 99, whatever. And, um, and they had a war like last year. Um, nobody remembers it because it was like, it happened so fast. You know, um, the Pakistani mil people, you know, terror Pakistani terrorists with ties to the Pakistani military kill a bunch of Indian police. The Indians, you know, they, they scramble some MiGs. The MiGs pretend to shoot down some Pakistani terrorist training camps. The Indian government declares success. 
the Pakistanis say there wasn't really a training camp and the people on both sides are like, kill the other guy. And the leaders are like, yeah, we're so tough on them. And they're like, yeah, no, hell no. We're not having a war. Right. Like, no way. Are you kidding me? There's like, a drama afraid. unfolding here. Uh, yeah. So, so it's kind of like, so, so it looked to me like the technology worked pretty well. It's a funny thing to say because the technology right. didn't do anything other than scare the crap out of the senior military establishment and the civilian leadership of those two countries. So, you know, I mean, it's kind of like people always say, well, people don't want to hear that or whatever. I mean, I find with my progressive friends, you know, including some family, um, they're like, well, we don't want to think that we solved war through a technical fix. Right. And I kind of go, well, it's kind of a technical fix, but it's also kind of a spiritual evolution. Um, and there's something kind of both barbaric and beautiful in it. The fact that it just, you kind of go, of course, the super duper powerful animal and evolved primates that we are, we just got so violent and powerful that it just did what Hegel would talk about, you know, which is that you get an increase in quality in quantity and then the quality of something changes. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, you look at the data and it's just deaths from wars and battles just just crash after 19, you know, 45, 1950. Yeah, so no I mean one, I think part no of it goes, to deal with it. What's that? No one wants to deal with it <laughs> with nuclear yeah. war. So, I mean, the part of the new mythology is like, look, this is some strong medicine. Most people don't want to hear it. Most people don't want to talk about it. But um, we actually are in the process of creating world peace through the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Um, and basically, there's no reason we can't eliminate extreme poverty in the world, like soon, 10 or 20 years. And carbon emissions have been going down in most rich countries for decades. Uh, we point, I point in the book, you know, carbon emissions peaked in the mid 70s in France, Germany, and Britain, they peaked in the United States about 15 years ago. Some people think global carbon emissions have peaked already. I don't think so, but, but probably around 2030. The human population's gonna probably peak at nine or 10 billion, depends on how quickly Africans prosper. And we've succeeded in saving a heck of a lot of endangered species. Um, protected areas have increased like tenfold over the last you know, half century, it's amazing. Still a bunch of problems. We overfish. There's still 2 billion people that use wood. We still have too many small family farms on the forest frontier in dangerous places like the like Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're doing pretty well on a lot of different metrics. And if you take a minute to just appreciate, you know, how far we've come since 1945, since 1900, since 1800, it's just hard to be, even I was thinking the other day, I was like, this coronavirus is like the worst thing. I mean, it's really, truly terrible, terrible event for many, many reasons. But 20 years from now, 100 years from now, it's just going to be a blip. And that all the trend lines, you know, mm -hmm. growth and prosperity should keep going. I, on the, you know, Adams for Peace type of aesthetic, it's interesting to me um, that in the Green New Deal uh, discussion, there's been this conscious attempt to use a very mid-century style. I've seen posters, for example, which look like they be, could be coming out of the New Deal era, you know, the, the actual New Deal era right. in the mid-century. And there's a way in which that period in history, right, America especially loves that aesthetic because of, I think, the optimism and confidence yes. that was in it. Uh, even a movie, uh, in Interstellar, which came out a, a few years ago now. Yes. But I remember finding that movie fascinating because it was, it was a very mid-century aesthetic, but set in, in the future. And yes. um, it shows how powerful an optimistic like vision like that is. Because even yeah. now, when the institutional and ideological legacy has been, you know, has undergone a lot of decay, invoking it still brings back those memories. It's my favorite thing about the Green New Deal. I don't, I, I created the, I helped create the original Green New Deal in the early 2000s, we called the New Apollo Project. And that's why I changed my mind about renewables because <laughs> that goes with that. But um, most of it I don't like, it's anti-nuclear, it's all renewables, whatever. But that part of it, I appreciate. I mean, there was a thing where, I mean, I was like, who killed the future? You know, who killed the optimism? That optimism of the 50s and 60s you know, it's already starting to go away in the 60s, but you know, that optimism was so inspiring and God, don't we need it right now? Of course we need it right now. And some more moderate embrace of government. You probably saw that Mark Andreessen wrote this really terrific essay on the need mm -hmm. to build. Mm -hmm. California, you know, I mean, 
there's no way we're going to survive this crisis without building a lot, like growing, building, attracting yeah, people. Totally. Attracting yeah, I'll, I'll plug Isaac Wilkes' response piece here. It's time to build for good. Uh, everyone read good. it. That was oh, on Palladium yeah. Magazine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, that's the part of it that I like. I mean, I do think that the, I think that this is also related to nuclear in the sense that the future suddenly looked really dark in the for a lot of people in the 60s. And some of that was the introduction, the marriage of Marxism and Malthusianism, which I describe a little bit in the book, which should are just seemingly opposite and they ended up hooking up. Some of it was the bomb, was the sense that, and some of it was the Holocaust. I mean, there was a sense in which, I think it's wrong, but there was a sense in which the technology had gone faster than ethics. It's one of the tropes you hear all right. the time from dark green types, right? Is that our ethics haven't caught up with our technology. I mean, we all know what they mean. They're not totally wrong, but the sense was we have to slow things down or even go back to what things were before the dreaded whatever, industrial revolution or before nuclear or whatever, but just back. It's just almost instinctual to go back to the past. And so all of those beautiful visions of the future basically got replaced with beautiful visions of the past mislabeled the future, right? The whole renewable, you know, you look at Ecotopia, this 1970s book by a Berkeley resident. They're all going back to using wood and farming. Nobody wants to, I mean, it's only in Berkeley, like people want to farm in their mind. You know, they, they think gardening is the same as farming, you know, but there was this idea you're going to go back in time um, so it's, some of that's old, that's just golden age stuff, but I think that that's how we, I mean, I'm glad to see it back in the Green New Deal. If they changed, if AOC would get her head screwed on right about nuclear, it would be a totally different, different projection. Uh, we have another question here that's quite interesting. Uh, Alicia asks, um, she basically, she's interested to hear what your theory of change is. And so which groups do you aim to influence first with your new book? How do you see that leading to other changes uh, downstream? Great question. Thank you for this question. It's great. Well, I mean, the book is, I mean, on the one hand, um, the book was, I mean, my editor was like, look, you know, like, uh, this is for Republicans, this book, you know, we'll get you on Fox News a couple times, you know, um, and he's a conservative, he's not, a, he's more of a libertarian, he's a never Trumper libertarian, so he's, he's, not, he's a vegetarian too, so he's not a very good Republican, but he, that was the whole idea, it was like, we're gonna have a book for Republicans, that's here's how you think about the environment, stop being a climate denier, but it's also not the end of the world. I was like, okay, right, like that's what I think. So I'll write that, I can write that book. But you know, you read the book, I mean, I'll be interested in your reaction, other people's reaction. It's kind of, I'm kind of, I'm, I read it myself and I kind of go, I'm still kind of a liberal guy. It's hard to read my book and be like, like my, my, word, my strongest criticisms of environmentalists is that they're insensitive to the needs of the poor. Kind of a progressive liberal thing. You know, I have a chapter mm -hmm. that defends markets but it's not, I'm not a libertarian. I've never been a libertarian. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think that the, I don't, I support all sorts of reasonable regulations and, you know. So, you know, the book's not conservative or right-wing when you read it. It's a criticism of the radical left. Um, but then, well, you know, let, I, let I, me, I, uh, maybe just touch, touch on the book there. I, so I took a look um, to the book in preparation for this and it is definitely very information heavy. So obviously through this discussion, there's a lot of um, points that, you know, we, we could have gone into stories and details. Um, I know that you in the book do actually go a lot more into organizations, uh, numbers, a lot of the detail and the arguments you're giving here. Um, I, I was sort of reading it more and it, it sounds like this is a little how you're thinking of it. it it's discussing a very particular set of issues and seems to be looking for um, agreement, I guess, on the issues rather than, you know, playing a, a bigger ideological or tribal game in that sense. Well, thank Does you. Does that sound correct to you? Yeah, um, it's it's um, it's not a polemic. The book is not a polemic. Um, I um, I've written polemics. Um, I like reading polemics. I like polemics, but polemics are um, polemics are short, fast you know, bam, you know, like, and, and, but they're not like, um, they, they, this, this book, you know, I, and, you know, my daughter's 14, you know, probably won't read it for a few years, but I kind of wrote it. I wanted to write a book that was like, look, 
here's what's go here's what the science says on climate here's what the science says on meat plastic waste and i wanted to do that and so what you find the first section of every chapter and i also wanted to take i want to take everybody's concerns including apocalyptic environmentalist concerns seriously so the first section of every chapter is the same i'm trying in every chapter of the book to open by representing my opponent's view better than they can do it i take a lot of pride in this that my the particularly the nuclear chapter i was like i'm just going to I'm a competitive person in general. So I was kind of like, I'm going to write the best anti-nuclear thing, like two pages of the best case against meat, against nuclear, for renewables. You know, just, I wanted to get that part. That's the first section. The second and third sections end up usually de debunking it with um, data and analysis. But then the rest of the sections, usually there's eight in a chapter, are more like asking the question that really motivated me to write the book, which was like, you know, if going vegetarian doesn't really reduce your carbon emissions very much, which it doesn't, somewhere between two and four percent, even if you go fully vegetarian, mm. why is everybody why is everybody think going vegetarian so important? You know, um, and if everybody says, oh, if it's for land use, then why why do you want pasture raised beef, which takes ten to twenty times more land than factory farmed beef? So to kind of, I wanted to go through all of that because my the thing that I kept asking was. Why are the people who are most alarmist and apocalyptic about various environmental issues also the most opposed to the obvious and often only solutions to those problems? If you're worried about endangered species, you should want factory farming. So why are you, so why, what's this? And it's well, on the one hand, you go, well, they, people don't know the facts. Oh, okay, maybe, and I provide the facts, but I always wanted to go, what's really going on here? Like there's something else going on here. You know, there's something deeper, something deeper, more psychological. And in the end, I conclude more existential. It more has to do with some questions, I think questions that we ask. People that don't believe in God or non-traditional gods um, are the people that, I mean, apocalyptic environmentalists are overwhelmingly supposedly secular people. Mm -hmm. So you have these people behaving in these radically religious, obviously religious ways. Everybody around you is like, you are a religious fanatic. Like everything you do, it's like a religious thing. You know, the clothes and the food and the moralizing and the apocalypse, it's all just religion. It's just obviously religion. And, right. and the scholars have written about this for decades. You know, they even, in fact, the, the best study of this, the scholar, he goes, he goes, the only way that it works for them to repeat so many of these Judeo-Christian myths and and motifs and and um, and tropes is that they never really learned Judeo-Christian religion, you know. So you actually find a lot of people. I think there's so there's so many generations of secular people raised by secular parents, secular like grandparents, and religion is just kind of this mumbo jumbo, and then they end up just repeating all of it. Yeah, it's Gen interesting. We sort of we sort of get this death of God moment in the culture where everyone stops believing, but then everyone kind of just fills the hole with other stuff anyway. So it, it doesn't actually go away. And I point out the book ends um, again. I, it's not I hope it's not spoiling too much, but <laughs> the book ends where um, you know um, the the there's a, there's this huge body of psychological research. It's incredible and and good um, replicated um, based on this one book from the mid, the mid 70s which is called the denial of death. And the argument of the book is that humans are different from other animals in that we are aware of our deaths. We are aware that we die from a young age. You know, my dog doesn't think about her death. I mean, she might be scared of being killed, but my dog doesn't contemplate. And so they don't really right. think about life in the same way. And so, um, so they um, normally, I mean, normally in the past, we would, uh, for, so the fear is so scary that we repress the fear. So most of the fear of death is, is repressed because you got to, if you're worried about dying all the time, you just can't live. So you repress the yeah. fears and you have the life, but then you have to find a story for why my life matters. Like what's important. So traditionally you find religion, religion says, if you behave in these ways, then you actually will live forever. You'll either be reincarnated or you'll go to heaven or something. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, people stop believing in that. You know, and some philosophers, Nietzsche is the most famous in the 19th century, they were like, look, it, when people stop believing in God and in the afterlife, that's going to be crazy because then anything 
is possible. That's an mm. interesting quote. Well, we, we had a, a, a long and interesting salon on this question uh, in our last one with John <laughs> Ferveke, who deals with these <laughs> yeah. uh, meaning crisis questions. So I encourage people to check that out. Gene has a sort of topical question here um, that I'd like to get to. So given that there is this um, apocalyptic expectation for nuclear energy, what have you found to be effective or ineffective uh, in your advocacy work to save nuclear plants? So, you know, where you're ta interacting this dynamic maybe, and now you're dealing with a very concrete issue and you have to convince people and communicate with them. Yeah, I mean, this book is this book is also an extension of my advocacy for nuclear. I mean, I wanted to, um, I basically, you know, I, I've been advocating for nuclear. We've we've successfully saved about you know twenty four reactors around the world. We'll take some credit for it anyway. Other people were involved. Um, Great. You know, I mean, a lot of it is just that nobody knows anything, and nobody knows anything because the nuclear industry doesn't actually exist. There's just these utilities. The most powerful people in the nuclear industry are these utilities. They own these nuclear plants. They're not loyal to them often. You know, if a politician wants to shut down the nuclear plants and do gas and wind, they're not it's really- It's kind of a, more of a bureaucracy than a lobby. Yeah, so I, I, fight for it. Um, how did that happen? It's sort of historically, like how did we end up with, with the nuclear plants not having kind of a uh, powerful company attached to them that, that's kind of invested in that? I mean, at first they did, you know, when nuclear was prestigious, I mean, nuclear, after World War II, nuclear was so prestigious. I mean, the weapons and the power plants, I mean, it was, when they yeah, created totally. the, uh, the predecessor to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, when they created the Atomic Energy Commission, in the, you know, in the histories, they would be like, they'd be like, well, we got to find, you know, people for the, these commissioners, the Atomic Energy, they should be the best Americans. It was like, they, it was like, who would, they have to be like, be, they, like, like the best, like the best scientists, the best scholar like with the space like, like the, ast the astronauts and the, and yeah. the stuff exactly. exactly you know and then and then you know you just get this war on nuclear i describe in the nuclear chapter you know just this 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 incredible grassroots political but also very powerful fossil fuel funded by the way uh, war on nuclear energy and by the time you get through that man these and these utilities who are just you know utilities there's some very nice people that work for utilities, but basically they're like politicians in the sense that their whole company is sort of needs to be responsive to the whole public. So they're very cautious. They're very conservative. So even like now, maybe it's changed a little bit, but it's like I would first interact with these guys. I'd be like, well, why aren't we talking about how much better nuclear is than fossil fuels? And they'd go, well, because, you know, we have a lot of fossil fuels in our fleet. It's like, well, so then you can't actually talk about like the main event, you can't talk about why nuclear is the best. So you've never had that. And you know, for a variety of reasons, the nerdiness, the social fear is the main factor. The nuclear industry and the scientific and technical community has basically just talked to itself for decades. So one of the things that we start doing is we just, just to, I'll just finish. Just yeah, right. go for it, go for we it. Just, we finally decided that this, that it's a little bit like the hero's journey in that like for nuclear, to save nuclear, for nuclear to save the world, I mean, in a non-apocalyptic non sense, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, uh, like the nuclear industry needs to become more heroic. It needs to, like the people in the nuclear industry need to find the courage to basically defend their technology. And so yeah. we've just, baby steps, we've just started doing more public demonstrations. We did 30 public demonstrations last year. We were like, what's the easiest thing people can do? Like what's like the minimum that you could ask somebody that works either at a nuclear plant or just a pro-nuclear person. What's the minimum? And we, so we decided it would be to stand up for nuclear, just stand up outside of train stations, plazas, parks, whatever. And so we did that last year. We were actually a little bit inspired by Greta Thunberg. Um, <laughs> and um, so just a few people showing up, standing up for nuclear. We're going to do it this year, um, you know, wearing masks, but we're going to do the same thing. And it's very powerful because, of course, the news media, you know, most journalists, it's like a man bites dog story. They're like, wait a second, there's a pro-nuclear protest? <laughs> it doesn't sound right, you know? And then they get there and it's like, wow, this is crazy. So we end up getting a lot of media attention, a lot of social media. And then the experience of the people that do it, it's like, I, first of all, I survived talking to people about why nuclear is good in public. And so they're inspired and excited by it. So we want to affect our view is our theory of change. I think that was the question is, we do believe you need a kind of social movement for this technology. You need, you need people that, that are passionate about the technology who recognize that 
only nuclear is climate essential. You just don't need, you don't need solar panels and wind turbines. Really, you don't. You don't even really need natural gas. You so, certainly don't need carbon capture and storage. Um, and I'm against, and I'm against, I'm personally against geoengineering. So what you really need on climate change, if you care about that at all, is nuclear power. It's the only thing you need. So this, this kind of gets us, there's all kinds of threads we could pull on here, but one that I'm particularly interested in is um, the larger issue. You mentioned that like the, the technical and scientific types have been kind of insular, politically insular and not kind of connected to the system for decades. And, you know, in the, in the war years and in the post-war years, you have these very prominent kind of heroic engineer types. You have Vannevar Bush, you have Von Braun, you know, Disney is here, here sort of like venerating these guys. Um, and, and then kind of like, if you look at the political culture in, in America and a lot of Western countries, it's all lawyers and, and, and so on, very much not technical people. And technical people have kind of like retreated into this nerd, self-stereotype and and i'm interested to hear if you if you have you know besides kind of this like nuclear kind of advocacy thing what what's going on there the larger analysis and and, and maybe what can be done about that because that seems like part of the problem right yeah 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 i mean basically what happened was um you know you had a you had a socialist marxist left in most industrialized countries before world war ii i mean after the stalin stuff it became kind of not okay, even setting aside the, the McCarthyism. And you get after World War II, and a lot of former socialists basically accommodated themselves with Malthusians. And then they really, you know, that it, we call that the new left. I mean, the new left is basically the unholy alliance of Marxism and Malthusianism. Um, and the agreement is basically, you know, um, we'll redistribute wealth from rich countries to poor countries rather than allowing poor countries to industrialize and develop like everybody else did. That became a very main, that, that pretty radical view, uh, that, like, that new left view became very powerful in the baby boomer generation, aided by the Vietnam War, which was a terrible war, you know, aided by Watergate. Um, so by the time you get to Three Mile Island in 1979, I mean, forget about it, right? Like by the time you get to 1979, I mean, the boomers are, they're already in their 30s, right? 45, 79? Uh, 79, yeah, uh, <laughs> 20s, yeah, late 20s. Yeah, um, so, you know, you, so for sure, like, and so there's a way in which you kind of go, is it inevitable that societies turn against the values that made them successful? This is the question that's being asked about decadence. Decadence, you know, it's, um, why, why, and it's a question we keep at, why do, why do societies undermine the values that made them so successful? You know, and, and there's been a bunch of conversations about that, but but definitely we can see in this context, we can sort of, in some ways, what I've just done is described that rejection of optimism and, and future and of the modernization project. But to really get at what's underneath it, you know, the book basically kind of goes, a big part of it is obviously the death of God. You know, it's a huge driver of, it's a huge anxiety provoking reality that keeps driving a particular segment of the population to be proposing pretty radical things and then kind of dressing them up as as much more moderate than they really are. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, you you touched on this here, but the the problem of succession that we touched on before seems to start from the top, right? Because you only get to a point where you have a lot of these powerful actors actively deconstructing um, knowledge transmission of, of nuclear and so on, when you've already lost the vision that was created, that that was serving. And, uh, you know, you've discussed kind of the ideological angle of this. Um, you could perhaps paint this as well as one form of ideology on the left not getting succeeded in the West. Beyond the West, obviously, it does. Um, all over Asia, you know, in, in most of the global South, those same movements did remain developmentalist, basically. Um, oh, now, and, we're and still, a, now we're seeing a full-blown anti-development, uh, anti-developmental. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking here in the same era that that the yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the counterpart is happening here. But basically, um, you know, it, it seems like if a vision really gets rebuilt, and uh, there's maybe a renewal of these of this sort of energy, a big 
problem to solve is how does one not have the same failure occur again? You know, how do you keep future generations inheriting not just the knowledge, but also the understanding of what it's serving? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty optimistic about um, millennials. You know, I'm a Gen Xer, so I feel like the older brother to millennials, and I'm going to take your side against mom and dad you know, the boomers. Um, and, and I wrote, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, and I'm, and my kids are zoomers, right? So yeah. I, I feel we like, have a mix of, of the audience here across generations that this is yeah. a very, uh, solidaristic, uh, project. Yeah. Yeah. I always said they, my, 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 my mostly millennial and, uh, staff, they hate it when I say it, but I was like, God, you know, the, 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 re the 2009 recession was like the best goddamn thing for millennials because it was just, you needed some of that, like adversity well now you get coronavirus so you guys are going to be the greatest generation you know <laughs> but I, I think millennials that, are getting radicalized by, by yeah well yeah. you get hit by the recession when you graduate and then by this when you're trying to have kids so yeah yeah like one two punch right i mean i see left and right breaking down everywhere i can't even it's just shocking to me like first of all the housing issue is just not mm -hmm. a left right issue you have liberals and conservatives on both sides of it Homelessness, drug abuse, mental illness. I can't figure out who's liberal or conservative on it half the time. Um, mm -hmm. You see Elon Musk, who's left wing on renewables and climate change, but takes an, uh, I mean, basically Elon and I are opposites. You know, he's a climate alarmist and a pandemic skeptic. I'm not right. a skeptic, but I'm a, he's a pandemic lukewarmer, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm not a climate alarmist. I care about it a lot, but I'm not an alarmist. I am a pandemic alarmist, but you kind of go, I don't know. Who's yeah. liberal, conservative? I, I, I mean, know. at Palladium, like a lot of, you know, we, we've we never bothered engaging, I think, with these legacy um, institutions and alignments. Right. Uh, we, right. We've tried very hard to build a community that's actually focusing on, let's look at the country and the world order. Let's look at these failures of institutions and how to rebuild them. And, um, you know, uh, uh, both the salons and uh, the other work we do with the magazine, I think it's been quite successful with the people we talk to, um, precisely because we're looking more at actually trying to solve certain problems, um, rather than, you know, play the same games over and over again. Right. So there's another I, one more question I'd like to I'd like to get through just because there were so many questions actually about it, uh, which is the fusion question. Um, so there, there's questions, suppose fusion, uh, happens, becomes cheap and easy. How are the environmentalists going to respond? What's the sort of balance of that versus fission? How will this actually relate to the people's sort of apocalyptic or not, uh, perception of the technologies? How will it, how will it generally affect things if, if fusion happens? Um, I mean, I, I, uh, let me try to answer a that question, I mean, I think the question is sort of asking me to, it may be asking me to predict something, but my prediction about how people are going to respond to fusion in the future is not very interesting because the track record sure. of people predicting future human behavior is terrible. Um, what I will say about fusion is I don't think it's that important in the same way. I don't think um, even having different kinds of fission are that important. I keep asking people that support fusion. I'm like, what do you get out of fusion that you don't get out of nuclear? People might say things like, well, you might get less waste or you might get, well, I don't really think nuclear waste is a problem right now. We don't have very much of it. In fact, it's a solution. Um, what is it? Is there a safety benefit? I don't know. How can nuclear energy even get that much safer? Um, I've always sort of imagined that you'd have fusion when we started doing space travel. Like just, I mean, you kind of go, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> like that would be one reason you might want it. But even there, I don't know. I talk to people and they say you could do fission. Um, I think what's important to remember is that the opposition to nuclear had really two big motivations. And I can't, um, I've tried to figure out which one I think is bigger, but it's just kind of pointless. There's two big motivations. The first was um, fear of the bomb, a desire to get rid of the bomb, a desire to make people afraid of the bomb. So there's just all the bomb stuff. That doesn't go away with fusion. You know, we have fusion bombs. So that doesn't, that fusion doesn't fix that. Um, and then the other motivation, the other thing that people really hated about nuclear is precisely that it was infinite energy. It was basically totally abundant energy. So this is the Malthusian critique. The original Malthusian critique is that we're going to run out of food. So not going to have food, and we're going to have famines and whatever. That shifts in the 50s and 60s. The new concern, because we had nuclear, 
was that we're not going to have enough scarcity. We're going to have too much abundance, and it's going to be a cancer on the earth, and it's going to destroy ourselves through some mechanism. Before climate change, it was overpopulation. Somehow you would get resource scarcity, but of course nuclear eliminates resource scarcity because you have infinite energy, infinite water, infinite fertilizer, infinite food. So my, my, I think what I, I, what I want to say about it is the desire to think that fusion would somehow not provoke, I think fusion would provoke the exact same reactions as fission um, until we overcome this psychic obstacle to nuclear energy, in my view, it will never properly expand or, or come, to, come to replace fossil fuels. So it really comes down to that kind of, again, the positive narrative, the positive mythology around we need to be imagining the kind of the, the great things we can do with nuclear rather than yeah being and this marks a fears. different this is, it marks a different view than i've had in the past i mean in the past i tended to i am in favor of technical fixes by the way i mean obviously right like every i want a technical fix <laughs> like so the I'm, technical fix for war <laughs> yeah i mean obviously I, the bomb is a technical fix for war um um not because i want it to be that's what it is um but with nuclear energy nuclear energy is a technical fix at the same time, there's no technical fix to the problem, the obs the main obstacle to nuclear energy. It's a consciousness fix. I mean, this is sound, I make I sound very hippie when I say that. It sounds very 60s. <laughs> this is it's, California. It's okay, right? I'm in Berkeley. You know, is that really the obstacle to nuclear is a change in consciousness? I, I just kind of go, they're not like, do you think they're gonna do something to the machine that's gonna make everybody comfortable with this completely wild, apocalyptic? Technology? No, it's just gonna. It's gonna have. You're gonna have to find peace in some other way. Um, and it's not gonna work through deception. We've they, yeah. they tried deception for decades. That didn't work. Um, they they tried. They've done all these innovations. It just doesn't. So that's why. That's why I'm. It kind of comes full circle. I used to think the problem was consciousness when I was a teenage apocalyptic environmentalist, and then I was like, well, it's technical. Everything's a technical fix, and now I'm kind of. It's consciousness and a technical fix. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. So this is a great place to wrap up. Actually, we've run out of time, I think, as well. So I want to give a special thanks to Michael for joining us. It's been such a fascinating conversation. I, I'm really, I'm loving the the ways that you're changing my worldview here, but also like deep resonances. Uh, this has been awesome. So I'm sure we're going to have to continue this conversation in the future. Uh, the book. Michael's book is Apocalypse Never, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. It's available for pre-order. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to, to reading the rest of it. I've gotten started. Um, you can follow Michael on Twitter at SchellenbergerMD, and you can follow Palladium on Twitter at PalladiumMag. Um, we have a new page on our website that makes it easy to subscribe to Palladium, become a member, which means that you get to come to these salons as an audience. Um, and ask questions. So visit palladiummag.com slash subscribe. Uh, many thanks to all of you who did join us. Uh, great questions, great energy in the chat. Thanks so much. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks again, guys.